Healthcare system, financing issues and trends. So what are the three types of government sponsored health insurance plans? Who's covered by each plan? Here's your answer. How do problems arise with quality service and cost in health care? Here's some basic health insurance terms that you really need to be familiar with. Health care reform uh, has been defined as the Affordable Care Act. It was signed into law in 2009, and it is the first sweeping piece of legislation to address health care reform in the United States since 1965 when Medicare was added to the Social Security Act. The two most common ways to finance health care services are fee-for-service and capitation. Fee-for-service is the traditional method of paying health care bills where the physicians are paid by the patient for every service. In fee-for-service, insurance companies charge deductibles, co-payments, and co-insurance. Pros of fee-for-service are most tests and treatments for the illnesses are covered. And cons are emphasis on illness, deductibles, and co-payments will keep clients from reporting the illness in the early stages when it's more easily treated. With capitation, this is a set monthly fee that is charged by the provider for each member of the insurance group for a specific set of services. It can include managed care such as HMOs and preferred provider organizations. If healthcare costs more than a monthly fee, then the provider will pick up the cost. Pros are that wellness is encouraged to help realize a profit. And cons are there are no deductibles or copays to realize a profit, so some of the necessary tests that should be ordered are not. So how do patients pay for healthcare services? The first one is personal payment or private pay where the payment is made directly by the patient. Some patients may use this method of payment today. The cost of health care services does discourage this use because health care is very expensive. Private pay patients may be able to negotiate a discount with some health care agencies. Private group health insurance pools individual contributions for a common group goal such as protection from financial disaster as a result of health care bills. It is offered by most employers in the United States and no member is denied coverage based on past medical history. Examples of private group health insurance would include Blue Cross Blue Shield, indemnity policies that are issued by commercial insurance companies, and health maintenance organizations. Private individual or non-group health insurance is offered by insurance companies to individuals who are not part of a group. They can be insured whether they're employed or not. The cost is generally higher than for group plans. Premiums are based on a person's health risk and age. Young and healthy people generally subsidize or support financially the sick and older people in the health insurance group. Those who are likely to have high medical bills are denied coverage. And administrative costs of private health insurance can run to 31% of premiums. Medicare is a program of Social Security. <clears throat> Again, it came about in 1965. It is a federally sponsored entitlement program and public health insurance plan that helps finance health care for all people that are 65 and older. You do have to have at least a 10-year record in the Medicare covered employment to be eligible and you must be a citizen or permanent resident of the United States. Medicare health plans uh, are funded again by the federal government. Part A is hospital insurance for inpatient hospital care. Part B is medical insurance for physician services, outpatient care, and diagnostic tests. So basically care outside of the hospital. 
Part C is Medicare Advantage plan that is offered by private insurance companies and it has to do more with what is um, available in a geographical area. And Part D is the Medicare drug legislation that provides prescription drug coverage. Medicare does not cover everything, so beneficiaries are encouraged to purchase supplemental coverage. Diagnosis related groups or the DRG system is where a math formula calculates the fee that the government will pay for the hospitalization per illness. It's the same fee irregardless of how many days the patient stays in the facility. So if a patient goes in for pneumonia, they, one patient, uh, both of them are on Medicare, but one patient is in the hospital, responds very, very well to the IV antibiotics, to the oxygen, etc., and is released within three days. Then the second patient uh, does not respond as well to the medication because there's probably some underlying disease process going on. And they end up staying in the hospital for two weeks. The amount that the government will reimburse is going to be the same based on the diagnosis of pneumonia, irregardless that the one patient stayed three days and the second patient stayed two weeks. The reimbursement cost is the same. Medicaid is medical assistance for eligible families and individuals that have low incomes and resources. It is a cooperative venture between federal and state governments and there's broad national guidelines. Each state will establish its own program services and eligibility requirements. The Children's Health Insurance Program or CHIP covers uninsured children up to 200 percent of the poverty level. Medicare assistance varies from state to state. A person might qualify in one state but they won't, re won't qualify in another and services do not cross state lines. The Affordable Care Act requires the federal government to create a process in conjunction with states where insurers have to justify unreasonable premium increases. Starting in 2014, citizens and legal residents have to had to obtain health insurance or pay a penalty. They were exempt if they were going to have to pay more than 8% of their income. They were low income religious exemptions, undocumented immigrants, incarcerated, or American Indians. Traditionally, those people that were, uh, that were uninsured were low-wage employees. <clears throat> they were employed in a low-wage job that is less likely to offer insurance benefits and did not re uh, provide enough income for them to purchase insurance or their middle class. Alternatives to pay for health care include Medicaid if they qualify, private pay if they can afford it, charity care if they can find it, or face medical bankruptcy. A lack of access to health care prevents individuals from receiving preventive care and seeking treatment when a health problem is developing and it's more easily treated. Many people rely on emergency departments for all levels of health care because they don't have insurance. The physician's office can turn people away based on their ability to pay, whereas the hospital cannot. The cost of needed health care becomes an issue when people are denied coverage. When they don't have health insurance as a benefit, they can't afford insurance premiums, they lose health insurance, or they're refused coverage. A downturn in the economy increases the number of uninsured who are hospitalized and treated in the emergency department where the bill is paid one way or the other by the community. Free services that hospitals provide to patients who show that they cannot afford to pay for their care is uncompensated care. 
For many uninsured, free health care is the only option they have, and it does result in huge yearly deficits for the health care organizations. There are laws, again, that require hospitals to provide free services to those in need, irregardless of their ability to pay. These laws lack specific requirements and are really vague as to the amount of free care hospitals must provide. Hospitals also look at bad debt as uncompensated care. These are services that the hospitals provide and they expect to receive payment for them, but they never do. For example, insurance companies or patients that don't pay bills. Those <coughs> insured individuals that don't pay their bills, as well as the difference between the, what the hospital receives for treating Medicare or Medicaid patients, and what it receives for treating privately insured patients. Both forces in public and private health care agencies all the time try to keep up with the marketplace. There is a need for cost containment, a need to hold costs to fixed limits. There's pressure from the federal government, insurance companies, employers, and consumers to minimize cost at the same time keeping quality. Nurses, including LPNs, are part of that bottom line on how to contain cost by reducing waste and increasing efficiency. So you have to make sure that you charge your patients for all the supplies used. You document appropriately to receive reimbursement. You provide efficient and effective patient care. You utilize interventions to decrease the length of stay or prevent complications in the patients you're caring for. And you meet the client's needs, not yours. Some reasons for the increase in health care costs are the costs of prescription drugs, medical malpractice lawsuits, and the development and increased use of medical technology. A source of revenue for government health care is income tax and payroll tax. These are used to raise revenue to pay for programs such as health care programs. And tax cuts will equal a decrease in the monies that are received by these programs. For example, unemployment means that there are no payroll taxes, as well as less money spent, so there's less tax revenue, and therefore a decrease is a raise in taxes overall, and that unfortunately is not voter friendly. There's a decrease in services, and it's not safe. We've all seen what cost cutting can do in the quality of care. Physicians say entitlement programs don't pay for the actual cost of treatment. We send money off to fight other nations' issues. There's increased money to combat nursing shortage. Insurance companies keep increasing premiums. Baby boomers, um, there's a large number of people that are not paying into the system, but they're taking money out, and we're at war. So the nation's economy directly affects health care. And the cost of prescription drugs. After decades of soaring drug prices, employers and health plans expect employees to pay more, more for their prescriptions. Drugs are expensive in the United States because the companies can charge full price for the drugs, and that includes the cost of research and development of the new drug. The continual rise in health care costs has resulted in annual increases in health insurance premiums for employers. Employers pass along the increasing cost of health insurance to workers. They decrease benefits or they stop offering benefits. Insurance companies don't cover non-essential medications. Physicians are required to prescribe less expensive drugs and large HMO plans negotiate lower prices because they've got so many participants and this isn't available to the government. So again, some prescriptions are not covered. Cheaper drug prices do exist in Canada because Canadian government price regulation and the currency exchange rate but drugs that are received from outside of the country do not have to conform to the 
FDA regulations on safety and efficacy, etc. Continuous quality improvement, or CQI, focuses on preventing problems or adverse e events. They are constantly studying um, ways to make improvements using evidence-based nursing practice. Aims of the Institute of Medicine for Improving Quality Care involves STEEP. It's S-T-E-E. E E P. S is for safe. You avoid injuries. Timely reduces the waits and the delays. Effective provides services to those that are going to benefit. Efficient avoids waste. Equitable provides the same care for everyone. And patient centered is care that respects the patient's preferences, needs, and values. Continued competency, uh, care providers have to demonstrate continued competency in order to improve the quality of health care. Improving safety in the health care, again, the Joint Commission National Patient Safety Goals reviews adverse incident studies on causes of serious harm and death to patients. The National Patient Safety Foundation improves the safety of care provided to patients and helps eliminate health care errors. And to decrease the cost of health care, we have to have cost containment. And once again, the nurse's role in containing health care costs in the work setting involve appropriately charging for supplies, documenting appropriately for reimbursement, using time efficiently through organization, doing the job right the first time, preventing patient complications, and meeting the patient's needs, not the nurse's. The major ways to accomplish health care reform are to do the following. Allow incremental changes in the marketplace. Enact comprehensive changes at the federal level. This continues to be patched rather than fixed. Those incremental changes haven't solved the problems of access to the uninsured, and every aspect tends to make their own changes and not work together to change. So incremental changes at the federal level include health insurance, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, and Obamacare. At the state level, we look at the uninsured, where states are attempting to reduce the rising health costs and cover their uninsured. And the local level, which is the retail health care. Retail stores such as Walmart, Target, and uh, CVS have added clinics that are staffed by nurse practitioners or physician assistants that treat common health conditions. Some comprehensive changes affect the health care system as a whole and not in a patchwork fashion. We look at the single payer system where the payment for doctors, hospitals, and other providers for comprehensive health care for everyone, regardless of past medical history, comes from a single fund. Medicare in the United States is an example of a single payer system. The VA <coughs> excuse me, is an example of socialized health care or medicine. And health savings accounts involves a medical savings account that allows people to save for medical expenses on a tax-free basis. It's linked with higher deductible health plans that have lower monthly premiums. The idea for the health savings account is that patients will be more money wise with how they use medical services if they must pay off the deductible of their annual health care bills from their accounts. <clears throat> Alliances allow coordination of delivery of care to help contain costs among providers of health care services. It provides an ability to deliver health care services more efficiently with fewer resources. All of the members within an alliance can buy supplies in quantity. They can share a computer system. And duplication of services and equipment is then avoided. 
Reconstruction is the strategy that's designed to decrease the cost of health care while maintaining the service and quality <coughs> excuse me, requ that require a radical shift in viewing how health care services are delivered. Managed care is control over the physician to decrease the amount of admissions, watch the length of stay in order to get paid. HMO, the emphasis is on prevention. The issues are delays in receiving diagnostic services and approval of procedures. The profits are increased for the HMO, but they make dissatisfied participants. And per preferred provider organizations are paid for like fee for services. They have negotiated discounted fees and networks, but the patients are able to choose a provider. So changes in the healthcare facility affect everybody. Unlicensed assistive personnel one strategy is for acute care facilities to continue the use of unlicensed assistive personnel. Cross-training allows staff to be assigned from units that have low census to units that have staffing needs caused by absences or increased patient census. Minimum nurse to patient ratios mandate nurse to patient ratios in an attempt to improve quality and service. Voluntary versus mandatory overtime is asking and requiring nursing staff to work beyond the regularly scheduled shift has been the method that some facilities used to attempt to provide patient coverage during the nursing shortage. And patient-focused care is the most dramatic change in the way that healthcare is delivered and it's been the shift toward patient-focused care. Procedures are simplified and they're made more efficient. You chart by exception and the only the abnormals are charted to decrease the amount of time documenting. Electronic medical records involve recording all patient data in the computer and it increases the efficiency by reducing or eliminating the need for paper records, medical history forms, test request forms, drug prescriptions, written physician comments, etc. Critical pathways. This cost-effective method helps the patient reach discharge in the fastest time possible. The Joint Commission sets compliance standards for quality care and patient safety. Quality improvement stresses the need to search continually for new ways to improve the process of patient care, prevent areas, and identify and fix problems using evidence-based practice. Nursing licensure considers a practical nurse minimally competent upon receiving their initial license and continued competence will be assumed throughout their career. So let's look at change from the victim's viewpoint. They look at change in a negative way. They fear the worst is going to happen because of the proposed change and they feel really helpless in this situation. They don't willingly participate in the change process and they allow the change to control them. Survivors resist the change, but they go along for the ride. They claim that the change is never going to work and if their prediction comes true, they're going to be the ones that say, I told you so. Navigators feel in control of the situation they're confident and excited about the possibility of being part of the solution to the problem. They believe that they have some control over change rather than being controlled by the change. And a personal plan for change. Nurses need to be a role model for their peers. <coughs> 